just want to say hello and, and thanks very much to Raymond and his team for organizing and then reorganizing this event to adapt to our new COVID realities. I'm not turning on my video because I've noticed on some that there's some slowing down. I also have some feline office mates that tend to interrupt me on occasion, so. I had that uh, earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as Raymond said, I'm Kathleen Draper and I've been involved in the biochar industry for the better part of a decade. I wear a variety of different hats in the biochar world, which has allowed me to have a fairly broad and perhaps unique perspective on this embryonic but increasingly essential industry. The, uh, the first biochar hat that I donned after completing a master's in sustainable management, where I wrote my thesis on a small scale replicable biochar production technology, was to launch, very, very naively, I confess, um, Finger Lakes Biochar. And nowadays, uh, FLB is focused on research, education, and consulting, mostly within New York State. Most recently, I've been working with Cornell University on the use of dairy, uh, biochar and dairy farms, and with the Rochester Institute of Technology on using biochar derived from food waste in different types of composite materials. I'm also part of the Ithaca Institute, started by my colleague, Hans-Peter Schmidt, uh, a true pioneer in the world of biochar and an inspiration when it comes to the topic of this presentation, which I'll get into more detail soon. As the current chair of the IBI board, I'm also fortunate to see and hear about some of the huge opportunities and hurdles facing the industry. And what I can tell you is the pace of change within the industry has begun to change exponentially, especially over the past 12 months or so. And as Albert mentioned, one of my more recent uh, hats is as a co-author for uh, Burn, in which we explore many different non-soil uses of biochar, including some which I'll touch on soon. And I've noticed that some of them have already been touched on by folks like Chuck and um, Brett. So Raymond and I discussed a variety of different topics for me to talk about, and I chose one that has been near and dear to my heart for the better part of a year and a half, as I've been planning and building what I call my dwelling on drawdown, which is my own personal sea sink sanctuary, part of which includes biochar, but other ways to sink carbon into a residential home and landscape. So I've been looking at the building and construction industry at both a micro and a macro level, and I see this as a huge opportunity to reimagine and refashion an industry responsible for emitting an outsized share of greenhouse gas emissions into one that could not only reduce emissions to zero, but potentially create vast new carbon sink opportunities using biochar. So as others have said, it's one of the few negative emissions technologies that is safe, scalable, and shovel ready. There are many different ways to slice up accountability for greenhouse gas emissions, but by any measure, the construction industry's climate impact is huge. It accounts for an estimated 36% of energy use globally, it's 40% here in the US, and nearly 40% of all carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, a majority of that is from what they call operational carbon. That's the energy needed to keep the lights on and control indoor uh, climate, albeit at the expense of our outdoor climate. Many organizations in the construction trade are keenly focused on reducing operational carbon, uh, largely through energy efficiency, switching to renewables and offsetting whatever they can reduce. Far fewer organizations are focusing on embodied carbon. That is the emissions related to manufacturing, transporting, use, and end-of-life management for the building materials themselves. This is a key area where I think biochar can play a pivotal role in going beyond net zero. This industry can not only provide multiple carbon sink opportunities, but it can, in fact, it already is, provide a source of feedstock for making biochar. So to paraphrase Sir Isaac Newton, what goes up must come down and buildings are no exception to this third law of motion. The amount of demolition debris combined with the unused construction material and debris from land clearing for construction is staggering, more than half a billion tons per year. Wood waste makes up a good portion of that waste stream and while some markets for the cleaner wood waste, such as dimensional lumbers, trees built for construction, and in some cases pallets, have been developed, 
the construction and demolition recycling industry is definitely on the hunt for larger and higher value markets. A few have already entered the biochar industry largely as a way to help them efficiently reduce the volume of wood waste through the use of systems like Tiger Cat's Carbonator, which can convert 10 tons per hour of wood waste into about a ton of biochar. Recently, the construction and demolition recycling industry has been funding biochar research to determine if biochar can help manage another one of their waste streams, fines, which are largely derived from drywall. These fines are currently often landfill, which can lead to health and safety concerns, as well as that rotten egg smell we all love to hate. And so far, the results are really quite promising. So this is an industry really interested in biochar. I see carbonization of construction debris as a large growth opportunity, especially as land spills close and they're choosier about what kinds of materials are allowed to be in the landfill. Imagine being able to provide carbonization services on site, eliminating transportation, and then using the biochar on site in any number of ways. I should note here that there are many types of wood that have blues and other potentially toxic chemicals of concern. So care must be taken with any of these materials before any wholesale recommendation to carbonize is given. Let's talk about banking carbon with biochar. As, those are, as others have already mentioned today, biochar doesn't actually pull carbon out of the air, but it does prevent it from converting back to CO2 and rising back into the atmosphere. This is what I call carbon interruptus. Unlike some other negative emissions technologies, putting biochar in the ground or in building materials often offers benefits beyond just carbon sequestration. There are at least two pathways for biochar to help the construction industry decarbonize. That's a word I increasingly dislike. As uh, Brett said, carbon's not the enemy here. We, nearly, we merely need to swap out our use of ancient carbon for, for what I like to call adolescent carbon. Anyway, the first way is to displace high embodied carbon materials with materials that lower embodied carbon or preferably those that are net negative or climate positive and that they store more carbon than they took to manufacture, transport and use. The second sink opportunity is to utilize biochar around the buildings in hardscape, softscape and in water management related areas. The notion of using biochar in buildings is still quite new and novel. The first well-documented use of it that I'm aware of is by my colleague, Hans-Peter Schmidt, who tested it in the plaster in his wine cellar several years ago. The benefits of adding biochar went well beyond banking carbon in this scenario. Improved humidity control, adsorption of toxins, electromagnetic shielding are but a few of those benefits. Since that initial foray into real world piloting, the academic community has conducted more research on its use in concrete, mortar, and asphalt. Additional benefits include improved insulation, fire resistance, compression strength, flexural strength, and biochar can also act as a curing accelerator. All of this depends on the types of biochar, the mixing recipes, and the intended end use for the composite. But with the right combinations, biochar can be used extensively to the extent that buildings can become net sequestering. Since the first pioneering efforts, many, many DIYers, and I include myself here, have explored blending biochar into bricks, concrete, and other composites using different kinds of binders, including recycled plastics, resins, and some more exotic materials. A few intrepid entrepreneurs are beginning to move into this space and eagerly looking for investment capital, I might add. In Germany, a startup called Made of Air is making construction materials for building exteriors and furniture out of biochar-based thermoplastics. On a larger scale, Interface, a US flooring company, has just announced Sequest Bio, a carpet tile backing product made using biochar. This is a multinational company that has been working quietly for the past few years to determine if they can replace calcium carbonate with biochar, how that impacts the embodied carbon, 
and whether they can source sufficient quality quantities of high quality biochar in different parts of the world where they have manufacturing facilities. This sort of product has the potential to create enormous demand for biochar. There are a few other companies at early stages of development that have prototyped biochar based composite lumber, cinder blocks, and one that I'm especially interested in, carbon foam for insulation. The research has proven that biochar can displace high embodied carbon products, such as carbon black, which is a fossil fuel derived ingredient often used to dye materials, or as I mentioned, carbon calcium, calcium carbonate, which is a mine substance used in carpet backing and in plastics extensively. One of Oops. One of my IBI board members, Hern Wai Pua, is an MIT PhD working in Singapore, and he's been investigating the use of biochar in concrete and mortar for several years now. And he's on the cusp of publishing information on what characteristics of biochar are best suited for its use in concrete and mortar. Once this type of information is accepted, methodologies for carbon removal using biochar in construction materials can be developed, which will then promote carbon financing, which will then support rehabilitation of both national and international infrastructure. When you compare these vast carbon storage opportunities, which provide enhanced construction materials with the notion of injecting CO2 into the earth's crevices solely to rebalance carbon with no additional co-benefits, it should be clear where we spend our time, attention, and funding. Hardscape unsurprisingly refers to inanimate landscape materials that are well hard, such as paved roads, driveways, walls, walkways, and other elements made from concrete, asphalt, stone, and even wood. Low quality biochar made from things like sewage sludge may not necessarily be something you wanna put into soils used for growing food. However, adding it to asphalt could be an excellent idea as it can not only sequester carbon, but it can sequester other heavy metals concentrated in the biochar. As you'll hear from Andre Von Ziel tomorrow, adding variable amounts and types of biochar can improve certain qualities of cold mix asphalt, such as rutting and heat resistance, elasticity and tensile strength. In Austria, they're adding it into warm mix asphalt. And in the US, research has shown that algal biochar and biochar made from swine manure can uh, improve anti-aging in asphalt. Another area where biochar has been used to great effect in hardscape is in permeable pavements, where it can be blended with gravel for improved infiltration and filtration of any toxins coming off the roads or roofs. I think Brett discussed this already, but this was first pioneered in the Stockholm Biochar Project. Carbon City Connections is a US startup that has prototyped lightweight cinder blocks and patio furniture made with biochar. And I really hope to see these coming out very soon. In contrast to hardscape, softscape includes all the natural living elements within the landscape, such as plants, trees, soils, etc. Planting trees with biochar, as someone previously mentioned earlier today, gives them a boost in terms of disease resistance, and has been shown to improve survival, survivability against ever increasing drought and pests. One thing I've witnessed on my own building project over the past few months is that topsoil around the building is often scraped away to make way for buildings and what remains is damaged by heavy equipment. Adding in biochar to the landscape after construction is one way to improve the soil properties such as water and nutrient holding capacity, and it can also improve compacted soils. A final area that I think offers huge carbon sink potential is what I'll call waterscape. That is elements within a residential or urban landscape that are dedicated to managing water, whether there's too much of it or too little of it. In my recent home building adventures, I've learned a lot about the amount of earth moving that happens in the name of water management. And I think utilizing biochar can offer benefits well beyond common carbon sinks here as well. So here's some of the waterscape sinks I am utilizing in my uh, dwelling on drawdown product project. The first is waterline trenches. 
in my part of the world, you have to dig a trench below the frost line. So that means four and a half feet deep. State regulations call for hauling in sand if you have rocky soils to protect the water lines when trenches are refilled. Using one foot of biochar instead of sand, I could have sequestered seven tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And it could potentially provide some thermal insulation as well. Understanding if shallow wood trenches could be built due to this thermal insulation is an open question. I considered whether to add biochar to the 18 inch trench that we uh, dug for the electrical, but given some of the electromagnetic properties of some kinds of biochar, I, did I decided to skip that until there's more research. Leach fields is another area of um, potential carbon sinks. Many construction sites require building leach fields or perhaps even wetlands to treat sewage generated on site. Often, and especially in my case, huge amounts of sand are imported to improve the soil's absorptive capacity in the leach field. While sand can help with certain types of filtration, using biochar can improve chemical filtration and adsorption. It will be well worth getting standards in place to include the use of biochar in leach beds. In lieu of having that right now for my current project, what I'm doing is digging six inches deeper than was called for in the approved plan and adding biochar in the um, shallow trench design. And this was something the civil engineer suggested after I talked to him ad nauseum about biochar. Uh, biochar can also aid in stormwater management more generally, both on a small scale, such as in drip line trenches, which I have an example of here, and as an underlying ingredient in dry creeks, rain gardens, and swales. Adding it to parking lots, driveways, and roadways, as Chuck Hegbert has already discussed, can significantly increase water retention and infiltration. So when you take all of these together, I think the opportunity to create a carbon sequestering, uh, net carbon sequestering house is, is quite feasible. Uh, Raymond, what I'm gonna ask you to do is stop screen sharing and then I will just show a few of the products I've discussed. Okay, here's my dwelling on drawdown in my background. You can see I'm sequestering carbon with straw and other elements. But here are a few of the products I mentioned. Let's see if you can see, I have to put it in front of me. This is a product, it's going to be a composite lumber made with biochar and recycled plastics. Here's another one, similar idea, but it's also got some e-waste blended in there. Here's a countertop material prototype, very lightweight and strong. That's got a little bit of biochar in it. I forget what the exact amounts are. Here's an example of a floor tile. This was made in Korea uh, with biochar. Unfortunately, they discontinued this because they could not make it cost effectively. This is a brick made my, by my friend David Derbauka in Canada. He's an environmental engineer that uh, remediates landfill leachate with fast growing poplar trees. And then he carbonizes the trees and those trees still have some heavy metals in them. So he's been looking at uh, non-soil uses. And here's another thing that David's prototype, which is drywall made with biochar. And then just a few of my little uh, prototypes. This is a plaster with biochar. Albert and I made these down at the farm. They, they're great little shot glasses, but I'm testing this for my home as one of the uh, plasters I'll be using over the straw bales. And one final one is here. The, uh, this is potential for carbon foam insulation. This was made with biochar and um, basically alginate, which is seaweed. So I yield back my time. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you, Kathleen.